Good evening everyone. My target this month is to complete this book Clinical Optics by L. Kington. I do have third edition. It's a PDF format. I didn't have a book as good. So the authors are Andrew R. L. Kington. And Helena J. Frank and Michael J. Garney. Green, I think. Yeah, Michael J. Green, whatever. So each day I decided to cover 10 pages and uh, revision of 10 pages in another video because I have to do small, small videos and then have that much cell memory. So without wasting time, I would like to start this book. First 10 pages I'm going to cover. Um, yeah. So proceeding towards the, my aim day by day. So page number one. And chapter 1. Properties of light and visual function. Light may be defined as energy to which the human eye is sensitive. So light is what? It is an energy to which the human eye is sensitive. It is defined in ophthalmology related to the eye. That is, it is energy to which the eye is sensitive. Scientists do not yet fully understand the true nature of light in the physical sense. But the behavior and properties of light have been extensively studied and are well known. This book aims to describe with the aid of diagrams those aspects of optics which are relevant to the practicing ophthalmology. In the first chapter, a simple account is given of the nature and properties of light. So electromagnetic spectrum, I have already made a video on electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I'm going to share that link. Optical radiation lies between X-rays and microwaves in the electromagnetic spectrum. So optical radiation between the X-rays and the microwaves in the electromagnetic spectrum. Now what is electromagnetic wave and everything I have given it in, I have already explained it in another video that I'm going to share. That link I'm going to share that video link. Um, so electromagnetic wave spectrum, it is divided into seven wave bands. This optical radiation that lies between X-rays and microwaves in the electromagnetic spectrum, it is divided into seven wave bands. Each of these seven wave bands grew together wavelengths which elicit similar biological reactions. These seven domains are ultraviolet C, 200 to 280 nanometer, ultraviolet B, 280 to 315 nanometer, ultraviolet A, 315 to 400 nanometer, visible radiation, 400 to 780 nanometer, infrared A, 780 to 1400 nanometer, infrared B, 1400 to 3000 nanometer, and infrared C, 3000 to 10,000 nanometer. As with all electromagnetic radiation, the shorter the wavelength, the greater the energy of the individual quantum or photons of optical radiation. So what are these seven wave bands in the optical radiation? Starting from the lower, I'll go for starting from the higher wavelength, sorry. Starting from the higher wavelength to the lower wavelength. That is, lower energy to the higher energy. From the infrared side to the ultraviolet side. So, infrared C, 10,000 to 3,000 nanometer. Then, infrared B, 3,000 to 1,400 nanometer. Then, infrared A, 1,400 to 780 nanometer. Then visible radiation, 400 to 780 nanometer. Then ultraviolet A, 315 to 400 nanometer. Then ultraviolet B, 315 to 280 nanometer. Then ultraviolet A, 280 to 200 nanometer. We just remember these numbers. Uh, 10,000, then 3,000, then 1,400, then 780, then 400, then 315. 280 and 200. Once again, just remember these uh, numbers so you will remember the range. So, first is um, 10,000, then 3,000, then 1,400, then 780, then 400, then 375, then 280, then 200 nanometer. Then you just go from infrared C to the ultraviolet A. Infrared C to the ultraviolet C, sorry. Infrared C, B, A, visible radiation, ultraviolet, 
अल्ट्रा वायलेट ए बी सी सो सी इंफ्रावेट सी बी ए इनविजिबल रेडिएशन देन अल्ट्रा वायलेट ए बी एंड सी सो बी सी अल्ट्रा वायलेट बी सी मीन्स शॉर्टर वेव लेंथ एंड इंफ्रा रेड बी सी मीन्स लॉन्गर वेव लेंथ दैट यू रिमेंबर दिस वे The cornea and the sclera of the eye absorb essentially all the incident optical radiation at very short wavelengths in the ultraviolet UV and UVC, and long wavelengths in the infrared IRB and IRC. The incident UV is strongly absorbed by the crystalline lens, while wavelengths in the range four hundred to one four zero zero nanometer visible light and near infrared pass through the ocular media to fall on the retina. The visible Wave lengths stimulate the retinal photoreceptors, giving the sensation of light. While the near infrared may give rise to thermal effects, because the refractive surfaces of the eye focus the incident infrared radiation on the retina, it can cause retinal damage. For example, eclipse points. I have made a handmade diagram in which you will understand these wave bands, these seven wave bands, more and their clinical significance. Color vision. The visible wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum are between four hundred and seven eighty nanometer. The color of any object is determined by the wavelength emitted or reflected from the surface. While light is mixture of wavelength of the visible spectrum, color is perceived by key population of cone photoreceptors in the retina, which are sensitive to light of short, blue, medium, green, or long red wavelength. So there are three kinds of the photoreceptors for short wavelength of light that is blue, then medium wavelength of light that is green, and longer wavelength of light that is red. So three kinds of the photoreceptors are the cones for the color perception. These are what first blue, then green, then red. That is from the shorter to the longer wavelength. Short blue, then middle green, and long red. A congenital color vision defect occurs if a cone pigment is absent or if there is a shift in its spectral sensitivity. Hence, deuteranopia, proteinopia, and tritinopia indicate absence of green, red, and blue cone function. And deuteranomaly, proteinomaly, and tritinomaly indicate a shift in the corresponding cone sensitivity. The X chromosome carries gene encoding for red and green pigment, whereas chromosome seven carries the blue pigment gene. Of men, eight percent, and of women, point five percent have a defect of red-green system. The commonest is deuteranomaly, which occurs in five percent of men and point three percent of women. Triton defects are rare. So what they are saying? So there are two terms: anopia and anomaly. So just remember D for green. P for red and T for blue. D for green, then P for red and T for blue. So deuteranopia, anopia means absence of that cone. So deuteranopia D for green. So green absence, green cone absence is deuteranopia. Proteinopia means means the person is not able to see the green color. That is deuteranopia. Then proteinopia. Proteinopia is Red cone absence, proteinopia, P for red. Then uh, tritinopia, tritinopia, anopia means absence, and T for blue, blue cone absence, tritinopia, absence of green, red, and blue cone functions. Deuteranopia, proteinopia, and tritinopia, <coughs> absence of the function. Just focus on this word, absence on the function. Then. Anomaly. Anomaly means weakness or abnormal spectral sensitivity. Uh, anomaly here, there is a weakness. Means they are stimulated, they can perceive, but there is a weakness, decreased function. You can say that is for that they have used anomaly word, and for absence word they have used anomaly. So deuteranomaly means green decreased sensitivity. Proteinomaly means red decreased in sensitivity to the red color. Then tritinomaly means decrease in the sensitivity to blue color. D for green, T for red, C for blue. Anomaly means decrease in the function. 
a decreased sexual sensitivity. So X chromosome it carries genes encoding for red and green pigment. So hereditary congenital uh, effects will be red green defect. Their, their effect uh, on the color vision uh, is manifested as red green uh, defect. Then seven carries the blue pigment gene. So which chromosomes are there? X chromosome, red green, and seventh chromosome, blue gene. X chromosome Q, Q arm, but it's long arm. Uh, of men, 8% and of women, 0.5% have a defect of the red green system, obviously more in males because of lack of one X chromosome. The commonest is deuteronomality, sorry, the commonest is deuteronomality, which occurs in 5% of men and 0.3% of the women, triton defects are rare. So triton defects are rare and uh, common anomaly is deuteronomality. That is green defect. It occurs in 5% of the men and 0.3% of the women. Congenital color defects characteristically affect particular part of the color spectrum. Acquired color defects occur throughout the spectrum but may be more pronounced in some regions. For example, acquired optic nerve disease tends to cause red green defect. An exception occurs in glaucoma and in autosomal optic, autosomal dominant optic neuropathy, which initially cause a predominant blue yellow deficit. Has recently been found that visual field loss in glaucoma is detected earlier if perimetry is performed using a blue light stimulus on a yellow background. Acquired retinal disease tends to cause blue yellow de defect. Acquired retinal disease tends to cause blue yellow defect, except in cone dystrophy and Stargardt species, which cause predominantly red green defect. So congenital color defects and acquired color defects. In congenital color defects, I'm gonna uh, make a, another video on color vision defects, um, difference between congenital and acquired color vision defects and the testing um, in a more elaborate way in another video. Let me finish first this uh, first 10 pages, then I'll come to the color vision part later on in another separate video. Uh, so congenital color defects, these are predominantly in the particular part of the color spectrum that is red green especially X chromosome and acquired color defect they occur throughout the color spectrum means all colors are affected decrease sensitivity to all colors but predominantly mostly um, it is more pronounced in a specific region for example blue or red green like that so so congenital color defects you know is especially um, it's mainly a uh, red green defect and then acquired co acquired color vision defects acquired color vision defects um, for example acquired optic nerve disease in acquired optic nerve disease what happens there is a red green defect but there are exceptions for example in glaucoma and autosomal dominant optic atrophy in which blue yellow deficit is there you can remember that thing because in glaucoma we use that blue stimulus against the uh, yellow background to detect the glaucoma early. And then, um, so acquired optic nerve diseases and acquired retinal diseases. In acquired retinal diseases, the prominent region that is affected is blue yellow. Blue yellow region is more prominently affected. Uh, except in cone dystrophy and Stargardt species in which red green defects are there. So uh, in a reverse way, how we can just revise it. For example, red green defects are seen in congenital defects predominantly. And uh, then we can see red green defects in acquired optic diseases, except in glaucoma and autosomal dominant optic atrophy. And we see the red green defects in retinal diseases except Stargardt disease and cone dystrophy and we uh, and we see the blue yellow defects in glaucoma that is acquired optic disease glaucoma and autosomal dominant optic atrophy and acquired retinal diseases uh, all acquired retinal diseases except the Stargardt disease and cone dystrophy so that was all about the color vision theory that is given in the L-Clinton now, clinical testing of the color vision. 
Clinical tests of color vision are designed to be performed in illumination equivalent to afternoon daylight in the northern hemisphere. So clinical tests of the color vision are designed to be performed in room illumination, normal room illumination, that is equivalent to afternoon daylight in the northern hemisphere. Now color vision tests. Color vision tests are uh, here. There are four color vision tests they have given here. Farnsworth Munsell test, FMU100 test, Bandy15 test, Ishihara test, and Lanthony New Color test. Lanthony New Color test it is used in children. Once again, Elkington uh, here in this first chapter um, gives four color vision tests, explains four color vision tests in short. Uh, Farnsworth Munsell test, Farnsworth Munsell Q100 test, FMU100 test. Then the day 15 test, Ishihara test, and Lanthony Nicola test. So, first, FM Q100 test, Farnsworth Munsell Q100 test is the most comprehensive method. It comprises 84 colored discs numbered in sequence on the undersurface and subdivided into four groups of 21. The colors of each group occupy a portion of the color spectrum. The color the colors differ only in hue and have equivalent brightness and saturation. Each group must be arranged in a row with the reference colors at each end and the intervening discs in order to closest color match. The order of placement indicates the nature of the color defect. So, Fastwood Munsell U100 is what it has. It has 84 colored discs. First thing. Then second thing, there are four groups, each containing 21 colors. And the colors have equal brightness and saturation, equivalent brightness and saturation. And the group must be arranged in a row with the reference colors that is given in each group. And um, the person has to arrange them according to its shade uh, in order to close this color match. The order of the placement indicates the nature of the color defect. I'll just search any YouTube video on this because um, we don't, we have never done this uh, in government college during my post graduation. I have never uh, done any of this test except Ishihara test. So I have no idea. So I have to search uh, YouTube video for that so that I understand myself and even yours. The day 15 test uses colors from all parts of the spectrum which must be arranged in order from a single reference color. The test does not distinguish mild color defects, but for most purposes, those passing the test are unlikely to have problems with the hue discrimination. Means the 15 test it is for the screening purpose because it uh, doesn't distinguish the mild color defect. So it is used for the screening purpose. And what it has, it has the all parts of the spectrum, and that need to be arranged in an order from single reference color. Means suppose it is blue, then blue shades are arranged, then red, then red shades, and pink shades, and then green shades. These are arranged. As per your choice, and there are charts, and they plot the charts according to the number, and that graph indicates the kind of color vision defect you have. I just um, passed this test and normal. So, uh, on internet, uh, this is given. I'm gonna share that link with you how to test this uh, D15, how to test your color vision with this D15 test. Then, Ishihara pseudo isochromatic test plates specifically test for congenital red brain defect. Just focus on this line, it's important. Ishihara pseudo isochromatic test plates specifically test for congenital red brain defect. They are saying congenital red brain defect. We used to uh, use this chart for every kind of color region, <laughs> like for screening, for driving, and even uh, optic nerve diseases, you know, so original diseases. We used to use this Ishihara chart, but they have given here. Ishihara pseudo isochromatic taste plates specifically taste for congenital red green defects. This line is very important. The most common abnormality of the color vision. The taste plates uh, consist of random spots of varying isochromatic density. Numbers or wavy lines for illiterates are represented by spots of different colors. A patient who is color blind will see only a random pattern of spots or uh, incorrect numbers. The figures can only be distinguished from the background by their color and not by a difference in contrast. So there are random different colored dots and you will see a particular line, maybe line or a number that you are 
the course will trace our uh, faster attack number, say that number to the examiner. Um, so depending upon what you see, the person gonna interpret, the doctor gonna interpret, or the optometrist gonna interpret whether you are normal or not, and what kind of color vision defect you have. So that was uh, Ishihara Pseudo Anthropometric Test. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it in detail later on. In another video, I'm gonna make another video for color vision testing. The Lanthani New Color Test tests view discrimination and can be used by children. Now, this Lanthani New Color Test, what is it? That also I'm gonna share in another video. So, which color vision test we saw in Elkington here in this first chapter? Farnsworth Munsell uh, 100 Hue Test, FM Hue 100 Test, then the Day 15 Test, then Ishihara Test, Ishihara Pseudo Isochromatic Test and the Lanthony Nuclear Test. Lanthony Nuclear Test it is used in children. Ultraviolet light. The retinal photoreceptors are also sensitive to wavelengths between 400 nanometer and 350 nanometer in the near ultraviolet uh, range that is UVA. Like it is sensitive to infrared rays uh, falling in the range of 1400 nanometer to 400 nanometer. Oh, 1400 to 700. That is the near infrared. That is infrared CDA. Yeah. Okay. So, so the retinal photoreceptors are also sensitive to wavelength between 400 nanometer and C50 nanometer in the near ultraviolet A. In the same way, it is sensitive to near infra, uh, near ultraviolet A. That is. C50 nanometer and 400 nanometer. So here it is 1400 nanometer, yeah, 780 to 14, 1400 nanometer to 780, and here it is 400 to C50 nanometer. UV and ultraviolet. Ultraviolet C, uh, ultraviolet A and ultraviolet, uh, infrared A and ultraviolet A. So you remember uh, near this uh, visible radiation, visible spectrum. This is infrared A, this is ultraviolet A, close to that AA and here BC and here BC, you remember in that way. So once again, the retinal photoreceptors are also sensitive to wavelength between 400 nanometer and C50 nanometer in the near ultraviolet A range. These wavelengths are normally absorbed by the lens of the eye. In aphakic eyes or pseudophakic eyes with intraocular implants without UV filters, such UV radiation gives rise to the sensation of blue or violet colors. Newly aphakic patients frequently remark that everything looks bluer than before the operation. Uh, of greater concern is the recent evidence that wavelengths between 350 nanometer in the ultraviolet and 441 nanometer the visible spectrum are potentially the most dangerous for causing retinal damage under normal environmental conditions. So intraocular implant lenses are therefore being produced which incorporate a UV A absorbing substance. Okay. The bright illumination employed in modern ophthalmic instruments may also cause retinal damage. Bright illumination that is used in modern ophthalmic instruments. These things also can cause retinal damage under some circumstances because near 451 nanometer also very dangerous so that visible light is also dangerous to the retina. Prolonged exposure to high intensity indirect ophthalmoscope illumination, intraocular light pipe illumination and operating microscope light. These are all potentially damaging to the retina, which may be which may in many instances already be unhealthy. Some instruments have yellow filters built into them to reduce exposure to the most damaging wavelength. So what they are saying here is um, the ultraviolet A, I told you that alarm, means our retinal photoreceptors are sensitive to the visible light spectrum, that is between the 784, uh, 780 nanometer to the 400 nanometer range, but it is also sensitive to the near infrared and near UV uh, rays, uh, uh, range, so it is Infrared A and UV A. So infrared A from 1400 to 780 nanometer and UV A is from 400 to um, C50 nanometer. Yeah. C50 
ही मिल पा रहा है सो दैट्स ऑल एंड इवन द ब्रांच एलिमिनेशन दिस यू वी वेव यू वी ए वेव एंड दिस इवन द विजुअल लाइफ स्पेक्ट्रम ऑफ द शॉर्ट ऑफ एविंग दिस आर वेरी डैमेज टू दिस रेटिन एंड दिस इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स वी यूज इन ऑस्थर्मिक सो द इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स वी यूज इन ऑस्थर्मोलॉजी फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई डी एंड ऑस्थर्मोस्कोप एलिमिनेशन इंस्ट्रा ऑक्यूलर लाइट or uh, light pipe illumination oxidizing microscopic light these can be very uh, damaging to the retina so these are used for a prolonged time in high intensity some instruments have yellow filters built into them to reduce exposure to the most damaging wavelengths okay now page number 5 fluorescence fluorescence is a property of a molecule to spontaneously emit light of longer wavelength when stimulated by light of shorter wavelength for example the the orange dye fluorescent sodium when excited by blue light 465 to 490 nanometer emits yellow green light 520 to 530 nanometer so fluorescence means what it is a property exhibited by certain substances for example orange dye of fluorescent sodium sodium fluorescent um then endocyanin green so let us see orange dye fluorescent sodium when excited by blue light that is between the 465 to 490 nanometer blue light uh, emits yellow green light 520 to 530 nanometer you are supposed to remember these numbers because when the fluorescent angel that means you have to use this dye very often and there are so many uses of this dye that also i'm going to make a separate video on that so this these numbers you must remember so it it is excited by blue light and it emits the uh, yellow green light so the range is 465 to 490 nanometer it absorbs 465 to 490 nanometer and it emits what 520 to 530 nanometer light absorbs 465 to 490 light emitted is 520 530 blue and yellow green Fluorescent angiography allows the state of retinal and choroidal circulation to be studied by photographing the passage of fluorescein to the vasculature after it has been administered systematically. While the light from the flash unit of fluorescein camera passes through a blue excitation filter to illuminate the fundus with blue light, the wavelength transmitted by the excitation filter approximate to the absorption spectrum of fluorescein. most of the light is absorbed some is reflected unchanged and some is changed to yellow green light by fluorescence the blue reflected light and yellow green fluorescent light leaving the eye are separated by yellow green barrier filter in the camera this blocks blue light and exposes the camera film only to yellow green light from the fluorescent thereby delineating the vascular structure and leakage of the dye The phenomenon of pseudo fluorescence occurs if there is an overlap in the spectral transmission of the excitation and barrier filters. This allows reflected wavelength at the green end of blue to pass through the barrier filter and appear as fluorescence. Other important applications of fluorescence include the staining of ocular surface defects, anterior segment angiography, the measurement of active tumor production and outflow, and in light microscopy. the localization of tissue constituents using fluorescein bound to specific immunoglobulin and even active tumor leak so you should know the fluorescence this property of the fluorescence exhibited by certain substances like endocyanin green and sodium orange dye of sodium fluorescein so they have this fluorescein property and that is used in ophthalmology and this phenomenon is very important to understand that some certain fluorescein substances they absorb the light of shorter wavelength and emit the light of the longer wavelength and here it is a sodium fluorescein that is orange dye of the sodium fluorescein and it absorbs the blue light and gives out the yellow green light which blue light it absorbs that is falling in the range of 465 to 490 nanometer and gives i gives out the uh, light it emits the light yellow green that is falling in between the 520 to 530 nanometer wavelength so they have what uh, described the fundus fluorescein angiography how it works that machine there is a blue excitation filter it filters it allows only blue rays to fall on the retina um and after administration of fluorescein dye it enters the vasculature of the retina 
and then it stimulates a uh, then uh, the fluorescent uh, phenomenon happens and it gives us those image then uh, this uh, image uh, yellow green wavelength and also other parts are also there so it's like a mixed spectrum along with the yellow green light other wavelengths are also there and these are filtered uh, by green barrier filter so in that way we can see the vasculature properly uh, so that is the phenomenon that is the basis of fluorescence from the fluorescent angiography and they are saying that pseudofluorescence occurs when this green barrier filter it is uh, what happens it allows it doesn't work properly and it this allows reflective wavelengths at the green end of blue to pass through the barrier filter and appear as fluorescence this allows reflected wavelengths at the green at the green end of blue so these blue excitation filter and green barrier filter if they overlap then we don't get a proper true fluorescence uh, what kind of fluorescence we get is called as pseudo fluorescence then what are the uses of this fluorescence phenomenon in ophthalmology is for sodium fluorescence you see uh, what are the uses for the fluorescent angiography then <coughs> anti-segment angiography is there then ocular surface defect corneal defect then anterior chamber uh, aqueous humor leak then obviously we see that intraocular patient is thermometry then the measurement of excess of production and outflow and in light microscopy the localization of the tissue constituents using fluorescent bound to the specific immunoglobulin and these are the uh, these are some uses of uh, fluorescent sodium given the Eglinton on this page and whatever I'm doing I have added some here so another fluorescent substance that is used in ophthalmology is endocyanin green so endocyanin green endocyanin green ICG dye is a fluorescent substance which absorbs 805 nanometer and emits that is shorter wavelength and longer wavelength 835 nanometer infrared radiation so it's infrared of range only so endocyanin green it absorbs the infrared emits the infrared but the wavelength so number is different obviously absorbing the wavelength of the shock absorbing the light of a smaller wavelength that is 805 nanometer and gives us the 835 nanometer the retinal pigment epithelium does not absorb this wavelength so retinal pigment epithelium doesn't absorb this wavelength and uh, it is therefore possible to observe the fluorescence of the choroidal circulation after ICG is administered intravenously, only 4% of 805 nanometer radiation absorbed by ICG is emitted at 835 nanometer compared with the total fluorescence of fluorescence. ICG angiography is not yet in general clinical use, but it has been shown to delineate upper choroidal neovascularization not visible with fluorescence. ICG has also used to photosensitize vascular lesions to dilate laser photocoagulation. So ICG uses endocyanin green again another fluorescent substance. It absorbs the infrared light, gives the infrared light, 805 nanometer absorbed and longer wavelength 835 nanometer is emitted. So endocyanin green is used in endocyanin green angiography and then also it is used uh, for dilate laser photocoagulation. So, for the treatment of some vascular lesions, photosensitizing agent, dialysis photocoagulation. The two uses of endocyanin green first is endocyanin green angiography and dialysis photocoagulation. Uh, yeah. So we use that photosensitizing substance. I forgot that kind. Okay, but I'll, I'll just say that. Endocyanin green and dialysis photocoagulation. I'll explain uh, in another video. Some small or uh, some short short videos I'm gonna make, whatever, because uh, in the revision part, I'm gonna uh, make another small small videos under the playlist of of this Elkington's revision. So in that, I'm gonna um, talk about the color vision, theory color vision test, then this. 
often this is an angiography and other uses of the fluorescence, sodium fluorescence dye and then endocyanin green also. In that I will be talking about the endocyanin green angiography and the fluorescent angiography, uh, the difference between them and uh, yeah, the dye is a photocoagulation of energy to use this in short. So I just covered five pages, I just covered six pages. And another four pages I'll cover in the part two video later on. So seven, eight, nine, and ten pages. I'll be talking about their theory of light, then interference, diffraction, and limits of resolution or resolving power. Here I conclude the part one of optics and things. So this is my handwritten and had made diagram and chart to explain the optical radiation, the seven wave bands of optical radiation lying between the microwaves and x-rays, electromagnetic wave spectrum, it ranges from the radio waves to cosmic rays, x-rays, gamma rays and all. So here you will see these radio waves, then microwaves and then this is the optical radiation uh, between the microwaves and x-rays and after that there is what? Oh, x-rays gamma rays and cosmic rays microwaves here there are radio waves so these are the seven wave bands this is the visible radiation on the right hand on the left hand side you will see this is the infrared region on the right hand side you will see the ultraviolet range on the right hand side oh, sorry on the left hand side you will see the longer wavelengths and on the left hand side you will see the shorter wavelength shorter wavelength means higher energy so you will see the optical radiation lying between the microwaves and x-rays that is uh, infrared C, B, A, then visible radiation, then ultraviolet A, B and C. So how to remember where the A lies? Visible radiation adjacent to the visible radiations uh, lie in infrared A and ultraviolet A region. So A, A, then B, C, then B, C like that you remember. So infrared C, you remember these numbers. 10,000, 3,000, 140, 780, 400, 75, 280 and 200. So you can remember the range of these seven wave bands. So infrared C, 3,000 to 10,000. You can say 10,000 to 3,000. Then infrared B, 3,000 to 140 nanometer. Infrared A, 1400 to 280 nanometer. Sorry, 780 nanometer. 1400 nanometer to 780 nanometer. Visible radiation falling between the 780 nanometer to 400 nanometer. Then ultraviolet A falling between the 400 to 315 nanometer. Then ultraviolet B between the 315 to 280 nanometer. And ultraviolet C between 280 to 200 nanometer. So you remember all these things and what is the significance why we should remember all these things. So infrared C and infrared B these are absorbed by the cornea and the sclera. These are the longer wavelengths. Also the cornea and sclera they absorb the shorter wavelengths. These are ultraviolet B and ultraviolet C. These are absorbed by the cornea and the sclera. Which are these? 3000 to 10,000. 1400 to 3000 nanometer infrared C and infrared B respectively and uh, th these are the longer wavelengths and shorter wavelengths ultraviolet B and ultraviolet C between um, 280 to 315 that is UVB and 200 to 280 nanometer UVC these are absorbed by the cornea and the lens and uh, this region these, these rays ultraviolet A rays falling between 400 to 315 nanometer these are absorbed by the crystalline or natural crystalline lens and what is the clinical significance of this is when the lens natural lens is taken out and we implant the intraocular lens that doesn't have the uv filters or if the patient is left or fakic then the patient complains that the patient is seeing everything bluer than uh, before the surgery so it is because these ultraviolet a rays these blue rays are falling on the retina stimulating the retinal photoreceptor and that's why which doesn't occur normally because of this crystalline lens it absorbs these uh, kind of wavelengths so we don't see that kind of blueness which uh, these ophicics and pseudophicics without uh, with uh, IOL without UV filters they see everything bluer than uh, before so that's a complaint and that's why it's very important to implant the intraocular lenses with UV filters because these are very damaging to the uh, retina now that was about the UVA 
and this infrared a region that is 1400 nanometer to 780 nanometer to visible radiation that is 780 nanometer to 400 nanometer these they pass through the ocular media fall onto the retina stimulate the photoreceptors and they give the sensation of the light these visible radiations and these infrared a they fall onto the retina and they have the thermal effect they can damage on the retina if their intensity is high and uh, and uh, if the exposure is for a longer time for example eclipse points because this eclipse during eclipse time um, the infrared rays they fall in this region they fall onto the retina and if we see it with the naked eye then we get the uh, we, we can burn our retina that is eclipse points so that is the clinical significance of these wave bands now in short color vision test uh, what kind of color vision tests we saw Ishihara Farnsworth Munsell test M U N S E L L test F M hundred U test then D fifteen test Lanthony New color test that is used in children Holmgren Sewell test Lantern test City University test um, Nagel's uh, anomaloscope test I don't know the pronunciation I call it Nagel Nigel Nigel anomaloscope test uh, Hardy Rand Ritter test so these are the color vision test once again what we learned in color vision test actually we learned only four that is Ishihara, Farnsworth, uh, Munsell, FM 100 U test, D15 and Lanthony new test in first chapter of El Kingdoms. I have added these um, few things, uh, few tests. I have added uh, these other tests here. Holmgren's wool test, Lantern test, City University test, Nagel's anomaloscope, Nagel's anomaloscope test and Hardy Rand Ritter test. So enough for today. So hope you have understood this. Thank you so much for listening to me patiently. Bye.